<laughs> Thank you for questioning the narrative, or at least seeking some evidence for it. Uh, today we're going to talk about masks. Yeah, one of the most irritating interventions that there is, particularly for people like me with pre-existing respiratory issues, and after like 15 minutes of wearing the thing, you start to feel like a Dexter victim, like you're being choked out by a magic diaper, you're tapping out on the verge of unconsciousness, you suddenly have a newfound appreciation for astronauts and deep sea divers. It's even worse when you know the science behind it. So let's get right into it, because it's going to be heavily academic today. I'll be uh, dropping names like Mike's on here, and uh, I got like 25-ish uh, citations in the description for you to peruse at your leisure after you've got the cliff notes from this video. So the first thing that you need to know, uh, this is the propagetic information you need going into our discussion. Uh, the two types of transmission that we're going to talk about. The first one is uh, droplet transmission. Droplets are emitted particles that are larger than five microns in diameter. Uh, the second is aerosols, or also called bioaerosols, and these are particles that are emitted which are below five microns in diameter. Masks generally are uh, designed to stop droplets, but uh, most researchers maintain that bioaerosols, again the smaller particles, are a primary route of viral transmission. Um, and we know this through, um, you know, as an intuitive conclusion, um, through a retrospective review of our previous experience with viral infections, with respiratory infections. Um, we know this uh, through empirical evidence. We can also test this simply by studying the efficacy of masks, because if masks are designed to block droplets, and they're also touted as a mitigative, uh, eff effectively mitigative for uh, viral transmission, then when you're studying masks and you see people continuing to get infected, we know one of three things is happening. Either the masks aren't collecting the droplets that they say they are, to uh, it's the aerosols which are penetrating the masks that are actually causing transmission, or uh, three, some combination of the first two. So um, in many of the authors who I'll be citing here have reiterated the primacy of aerosol transmission as opposed to droplet transmission or as opposed to only droplet transmission. Um, for example, McIntyre, uh, Ruhman, and Alia uh, showed in their study uh, that medical masks had a, not only had a non-significant impact on transmission, but they also reaffirmed that um, because of this, aerosols were, were likely the mode by which infections were transmitted. Uh, nonetheless, masks are touted at least as being useful for droplet transmission or protecting against them, um, although this itself is questionable after prolonged use. So um, scholars like Rancourt mentioned that as the mask is saturated, uh, those collected droplets, whatever it does, the, the larger particles that it does trap in its fibers, they may burst during regular respiration, during regular breathing, and this would spread virions, viral particles, more widely than had the droplets simply been expelled normally. But the general guidance still was to use masks to, uh, was in, re in relation to droplets. This was the guidance, uh, even the WHO, before some serious backtracking, mentioned that masks could only be used to prevent droplet spread. Desai and Moroda likewise say that surgical masks um, are at, at best can offer some prevention from droplet transmission, um, for which reason they concluded that only symptomatic people or people in close contact with symptomatic people uh, should be using masks at all because it's only during uh, symptomatic events, during coughing and sneezing that you're gonna expel droplets of that size. Um, but even in the cases, there, there are plenty of studies out there that show uh, or seem to show that masks do have some, uh, have a high degree of efficacy against aerosols, the smaller particles. Um, 
but the problem is how these studies are conducted and uh, the disparity between them and real world settings. As uh, Isaacs, Britton, and Outred state that uh, the results of these types of studies are confounded by things like fit, so how tight the mask fits, how well it fits, and uh, human factors. Human factors, uh, I mean, things like improper disposal, touching the surface of the mask, Eskimo kissing your boyfriend and posting it on Instagram to flex your moral rectitude on all these Trump supporters out here swatting grandmas like flies. Human factors. These are things that you can't con control for in any type of study that's not done in real world settings. Um, Lupaglycuria et alia also, in their study on all masks, all mask types, um, they note that their testing was done with perfect fit. So what they had found was that uh, all the masks except N95s showed permeability. That means that particles were able to, trans, uh, to penetrate the mask. Um, but they made a note that in, even in their study, they did it with perfect fit. So in a real world setting, it would be even less efficacious than the infinitesimal protection that they did offer. Uh, Brousseau and Sietzema, in their commentary on uh, mask for all policies, likewise say that the design of medical masks, as opposed to N95s, are loose fitting, which means that they divert emission, they, div they divert your breath up and around the mask, which would make them only useful for droplets, even if in the studies uh, that you can find on those masks show some efficacy in aerosols. Uh, we've all had the experience now of uh, feeling our own hot breath on our eyes or reflected back up on our face, no matter how tightly affixed our smile hiders are. You see, because for marginal efficacy, you have to achieve an almost impossible degree of fit. It's got to be hermetic. It means like airtight, vacuum sealed, like Ziploc level tightness here. So uh, we also need to take into consideration the points raised by scholars like Klompus, Morris, et alia in their study that uh, even if we were to say, okay, fine, masks are only going to be protective or preventative with regards to droplets, they still wouldn't protect from droplets that manage to get into your eyes or the membranes around your eyes, or uh, if you were to touch a droplet in the environment and then touch your eyes, even while you were wearing a mask. And these are, again, the human factors that Isaacs in Britain and Outred were talking about earlier. So, okay, how have, uh, how have they done in the studies, though? How have the masks done in studies that, that have been conducted? So, Jun Kim et alia found in their study on all mask types that both surgical and general masks offered little protective function. In fact, they, they concluded that general masks offered no protection function whatsoever. Uh, and you see this again and again in the literature, the authors of the rapid response uh, to a paper by Greenhow likewise noted that cloth masks had around 0% efficacy. Um, on the high end, we see, I think, Jay Arman, uh, reported 0.7% 0 .7, 0 .7 efficacy for cloth masks. Uh, so even when, according to the, in the article by the rapid response uh, authors, even when they uh, were experimenting with how many layers a cloth mask would require to get any, you know, uh, any sufficient degree of filtration, they had, even when they raised the layers to the point that the pressure drop would lead to unconsciousness in the wearer, you still only got a filtration of around 60%. It barely broke 60%. So they maintain that, you know, while there may be some utility in blocking droplets, uh, there wouldn't be in blocking any virus-laden aerosols. And they corroborated the view that bioaerosols are indeed a primary mode of transmission. And of course, they're not the only one. I've mentioned some earlier, Grout, uh, also Grouton et alia, uh, and others state that in all cases, dispersal occurs via both types of emission, droplets and aerosols. So we have to look at both of them. Any mitigation that only, it only affects one type of transmission or that only uh, impacts the degree of transmission via one type of emission is not gonna be efficacious in preventing spread.
There's another issue to, t to consider is, uh, and we alluded to this earlier, uh, masks being counterproductive, actually. Um, so, and many authors now have drawn attention to this problem. Uh, Isaac's Britain and Outred, in fact, uh, state declaratively the fears of the authors of the rapid response that when masks become porous, which is inevitable after prolonged use, the, uh, they no longer protect. They were designed as single-use items, and wearing a mask for hours actually increases the risk of infecting others. Kebera and Kebera also echo the dangers of saturation, mask saturation, after 20 minutes. And they cite the famous study done by Tunavo, uh, one of the only controlled trials done on masks versus no masks, uh, in which he studied uh, the, a group of surgeons where, where he kept the masks on and a group of surgeons where they were not wearing a mask. And he wanted to look at the rates of post-operative wound infections in the patients. And what he found was that the surgeons that wore the masks were more likely to infect their patients. Um, and also we have, uh, and, and so that's for surgical masks, for medical masks. Um, Dan McIntyre uh, at Alia also found the same type of uh, type of risk in cloth masks. They found higher rates of infection in cloth mask wearers. Rancourt offers a similar view to Isaacs in Britain uh, and Outred that uh, COVID doesn't remain trapped uh, in the fibers of the mask after saturation. They're expelled and distributed more broadly than they would have been if they were emitted naturally, which would increase infection rates. And this, in fo uh, this follows pretty intuitively uh, if we consider, you know, that pathogen collection is going to increase viral load. Um, and that makes sense, right? As you're collecting virions, you're making the viral load denser. And viral load is important because you need to reach a certain level of load for an emission to become infectious. On that note, it would be informative to look at the fantastic study done by Lung Shu uh, Chu at Alia. Uh, again, one of the only really well done studies out there, but this is a, a more contemporary study, um, where they tested masked and unmasked emissions from patients who had respiratory viruses. They looked at people with influenza viruses, uh, rhinoviruses, and coronaviruses. Uh, and they found that in the subset of patients that didn't cough, that had coronaviruses, um, and this is different from what they found with influenza patients and rhinovirus patients, that neither aerosol or droplet emissions were detectable, uh, with detectable virus were found in the coronavirus patients when they were breathing normally if they didn't cough. Uh, and they also found that in the no mask arm, that is the, the group that wasn't wearing a mask, the, the majority of coronavirus patients who coughed still didn't present detectable viruses, even while they were coughing. And the few that did showed very low li viral loads, meaning they probably wouldn't be infectious. And that's with no mask at all. So you may say at this point, well, okay, we get that, that's fine, but we're gonna wear the masks because better safe than sorry, better safe than sorry, right? <laughs> But that's actually what we're talking about here. We're talking about wearing the mask being being a disease vector. It's causing infections in other people. And the, we've talked about the viral, the increase of viral infection, but there's also an increase in bacterial infection possibility because as a mask is saturated, as it becomes moist, it basically just becomes a bacterial petri dish. There's the issue of carbon dioxide collection. Now, hypercavity is probably not gonna happen. But uh, you do begin to see deleterious effects of carbon dioxide collection, CO2 particle collection, at 467 parts per million. That's not a lot. And it probably has something to do with, uh, you know, all of the uh, anecdotes we've had from the retail workers that have had to wear a mask for eight to 10 hours and are going home with headaches every day. Um, and, you know, as, as you progress in, CO2 collection, then you get up to really serious issues like seizures and unconsciousness. Um, and there's the fourth one, fourth issue is a uh, decrease in blood O2. Um, there's also a possibility of just, you know, 
general obstruction of, of vision, but I, I haven't seen too much research on um, the likelihood of the elderly falling and, and things like that, but I have seen some, some noise being made about that. Um, and, you know, the, this is one of the fundamental things, one of the first things that health scientists would consider before normally they would introduce any intervention. Rancourt and the authors of the uh, rapid response and plenty of others also point out that what's happening now is actually in an inversion of what's called the precautionary principle in the health sciences. Um, people are calling for a ubiquitous implementation of a new intervention, uh, falsely invoking the precautionary principle, but what it actually demands is to abstain from introducing any new procedure until its negative effects are known and accounted for. Um, but we have experts invoking this principle for the very thing it was de it was derived to prevent. Uh, and, you know, people like Greenhalgh and those that have done so have been called out on this by others in the field. And I, I can't see this myself except as a pat exploitation of the mentality of the average person to whose mind the idea of wearing masks as a precautionary measure um, is readily understandable and seems like, you know, the thing to do. But they're not thinking like health scientists because the issue is creating a unknown number of unknown new issues. So that's why you always have to study the thing completely before you introduce it, anything new. Uh, but at least, you know, even if we weren't to consider or the possibility of the negative repercussions of masks, we at least have a chronicle of experience with pandemics now and mask use that we can look to to at least see if they were efficacious in preventing transmission, if not harmful. And, um, you know, scientists again and again have called for us to look at these experiences. Rousseau and Sietzema, for instance, point out that they were just totally useless. Like all masks were, had no effect whatsoever during the 1918 outbreak. Um, Isaacs, Britain and Outred um, discussed their uselessness during the H1N1 outbreak. Um, the authors of the rapid response uh, talk about how even in you know experimental set, uh, settings, there's just a paucity of studies done on community settings and uh, and they mentioned that the few that have done, because we, we need to look at the community settings to see if they're efficacious in, in the real world during a pandemic. And, um, you know, they mentioned that the few that have been done showed no reduced transmission, just like we see in the real live outbreaks of 1918, H1N1, Ebola, et cetera. Um, so we have, and then that's why we have findings like McIntyre's, um, that medical mask wearers were only 12% less likely to be infected and that these results themselves weren't even statistically significant. Dang Seal at Alia also found no difference between medical masks and standard practice in healthcare settings. Bay Songman at Alia also found no difference in mask efficacy for COVID-19 patients. But that article, the last article that I mentioned, was retracted at the request of the publisher, which gets us into the last problem that we're going to talk about today, which is uh, something that's been going on for a long time in academia, and that's academic bias and academic fraud. But it's particularly notable here with with coronavirus, with COVID-19. Um, so for Bay Songman et al., in response to reader protestation, and the publisher's consequent request, they offered to provide additional data from more patients to you know, prove their results, but were summarily refused by the journal. They, they weren't even allowed to bring supporting evidence to you know, buttress the, the thesis of their article. And we see similar things throughout the literature. Papers that dissent from the desire narrative are being censored, removed, or updated with a note from the author saying that they support current policies, their scientific results notwithstanding. Uh, we see this in Clompus, at Alia, in Bay, just mentioned, and 
others. Rarely will you find authors like Rousseau and Sietzema who address the complaints and there was just a panoply of outrage because their, uh, you know, their statements and their commentary was incontrovertible and they presented all the evidence that you could find on there. Uh, and, and many of the, you know, many of the complaints from the readers were just, uh, you know, the most ridiculous like vapid things that you could find, but you know they addressed all, they addressed the generality of the complaints and they stood by their work. Um, and rarely will you find authors that are doing that. Most of them will capitulate and uh, append their article with a note saying, you know, I know we found that there was no efficacy, but we're the masks anyway. We support government policies. It's worse than that. Is uh, as von Savalve points out. Uh, we see the opposite phenomenon with articles that do support the narrative. Uh, so even the most unapologetically poor science, such as uh, we see in the famous Molina and Zhang study, uh, if they support the narrative being marketed, they're lauded and used as policy rationale, um, which is circular reasoning, incidentally, right? So that's pretty much what I have to say on this topic now, or at least on the scientific issues at play. Um, I may do another video on, you know, the, the philosophy of masks, uh, you know, what do they mean, right? We've talked about how their, their biological impact, but what about the human impact uh, on a more holistic level, on a macro level? Um, you know, get out of the microbes and virions and talk about why we've even allowed this to happen. Um, so I'll leave you with some questions, right? What are we going to do about this? Because there is no science as, you know, and that's the reason why every single country in the Scandinavian region, um, in spite of the fact that they have completely different, I mean, you see different epidemiological curves. They have different populations. They're different countries. You can't actually compare them. They all, uh, said there's no science behind the mask, so we're not going to force people to wear the masks. Um, so are we going to keep obfuscating the science? Are we going to keep pulling things out of thin air to try and ad hoc rationalize a pointless, potentially harmful, divisive, and certainly dehumanizing government-mandated uniform? Um, the good thing is it's kind of up to you. You do have the choice, but you have to be vocal about your opposition. And um, it definitely helps to educate yourself, which is why I've got all the articles that I've cited here in the video, in the description. Um, if you don't look at them, at least share the video or, you know, at least look at the abstracts, look at something, um, share the share the sources so, so that other people that are, want, are interested in looking at them, can look at it, and, um, you know, let's talk about this stuff, right? Let's not uh, leave the sort of, uh, leave the obfuscation to, to, take, to take precedence. Uh, so, I'll leave you with that. Go crazy. Have fun with the, uh, with the research, and um, I'll see you next time.